Please open your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's a joy and a privilege to bring the Word this morning as one who was once dead in trespasses and sins. But by the grace of God, received the gift of repentance and the gift of faith to turn to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And I pray that as we look at the Scriptures this morning, particularly concerning Christ's body, the church, as we wait for our risen Savior to return, that He alone will be magnified and glorified in our midst, and that all praise will be to Him. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 3 through 5, which describes the wonderful work of salvation. And then we're going to turn over to chapter 2 and verses 4 through 10 and see how those who are in Christ are part of a building of which Christ Himself is the cornerstone. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And as we wait, going over to chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, we continually come to Christ. As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the Word as they were destined to do. But you, you plural, you all, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Last week and this week, we are considering church membership. We're considering the body of Christ. My fellow elders requested that I preach on this theme for the encouragement of our body, for our edification in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a joy to do so. Why is it that we are spending time, and spending time even at this critical point in many's liturgical calendar, the resurrection of Christ, to consider the church? Well, there are several reasons. When we think about the church and church membership, 
It's a reflection of the priority in the New Testament. The New Testament prioritizes the local church. And all throughout the New Testament, we find an assumption that followers of Christ will be committed to a local church. All of the epistles are written, well, not, not all except the pastoral epistles in Philemon. They're written to churches, local churches, local assemblies. Also, as we think about church membership, the priority of the church, there's an element of polemic to what we're doing. We're standing against the seeker-sensitive philosophy of this age that goes to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, that goes to those who are driven by the world, the world which is under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, and asks them what they want in a church. It is a vile departure from Scripture. Considering the local church and the significance of church membership also stands against the deification of individual Christian experience. In other words, the idea that my experience is what validates the truth. And when we think like that, it is a deification of individual Christian experience. Truth is truth regardless of what my experience is. Truth is from God, and truth is in His Word. His Word is authoritative. We also stand against a consumer mindset of Christianity that says church is about you getting what you want and getting to do the things you like to do. That's not the scriptural paradigm of church. And we stand against these things not simply to be adversarial. No one likes to be adversarial and confrontational. No, we stand against these things because Christ is precious. We stand against these things because we serve a risen Savior who is going to return. And what is at stake is the eternal destiny of souls. And so we hold forth Christ. We do not hold forth worldly philosophies. We do not seek to bring people in with gimmicks that appeal to the flesh. No, Christ is too precious. Our Savior reigns. We long to be under His authority and to speak truly as ambassadors for Christ. But also considering the local church and church membership is for the encouragement of our body, of our committed members, those who serve so well and so faithfully, those who love the Lord, those who are grieved when others leave. And it prepares the way for new members, for those of you that are logging and wanting to be a part of this local body. And so again, it is a great joy to deliver the message this morning on this theme. And I also think it's important to point out that this is part of a larger series where Pastor Don has preached on love and church membership and also under the Spirit's influence, which are also two critical messages that factor into what we're saying and emphasizing the importance of the local church. The church exists because Jesus defeated death. Paul, in his letter to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he begins that letter with an emphasis on the cross, he deals with a number of issues in the local church. And then he comes to the resurrection in chapter 15, and he encourages them with this statement, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ is alive, 
And because Christ is alive, his resurrection was the the guarantee and the validation of the statements that he made when he was on the earth. For example, in John 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus said, everyone is going to rise. And Christ, by His resurrection, is is the first fruits. He is the guarantee that there will be a resurrection and that all will rise, both the righteous and the unrighteous. The righteous will rise and, and they will be forever and ever in the gracious presence of God and of the Son, glorified. The unrighteous will rise to judgment and they will be condemned to eternity apart from the gracious presence of God in a place called hell prepared for the devil and his angels. That day is coming. And as we await Christ's return, Christ has ordained that the church hold forth his truth that the church maintain and hold up the confession of who He is, that He accomplished His work, that we announce that He is coming again and we call people to acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior by turning away from sin, turning to Him for forgiveness. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23 that by nature of His resurrection, all things right now, even as we await Christ's return, all things right now are under the authority of Christ. Christ rules over all for the purpose of building His church. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1, verse 22. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all and all. Our president will die. Emperors have died. Kings have died. Governors have died. Every person who's held any kind of authority has died. Empires have risen and fallen. And Christ reigns over all. Christ builds His church, and He has been for 2,000 years, and He will continue to do so until He returns. He lives. He's risen. He reigns, and He is returning. The church the church consists of those who are justified by faith in Christ, those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and those who are sealed with the indwelling Spirit of God. And just to recapture a little of what we laid out last week and capture some of the momentum from last week, we need to clarify and and understand that when we're talking about the church, what, what are we talking about? Well, there's a couple of distinctions that are important. First of all, the church is not Israel. Israel and the church are distinct. All of the promises in the Old Testament, in other words, that are to Israel do not now apply to the church. We also need to remember that there is a visible and invisible aspect of the church. The visible church is what we see gathered. It's what's happening around the globe as local congregations come together. This is the visible church. But yet within the visible church, there is the reality that not everyone who comes is truly redeemed. Not everyone who comes is truly a follower of Christ. And so the invisible aspect of the church speaks of those who truly belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then there is another distinction, and that of the universal and the local. The universal church is, consists of all those throughout the church age who have turned to Christ and all who will. And the local church, the local church is the visible representation of those who are redeemed, the visible expression of those who are redeemed and who come together as the body of Christ to, to do the work of Christ as laid out in the Word to hold forth the truth of the doctrine of Christ. And so when we talk about church membership, that's what we are focusing on. We're talking about the expression of those redeemed gathered together in a place as a local assembly. And we're laying out broad principles to cultivate and inform our understanding as we face specific choices. So just to recover where we were last week, the theme, our working theme, is that the church matters or the church is precious or important to those purchased by Christ. And the first two points that we looked at last week are the biblical basis for church membership. And we simply established that in the New Testament, it's clear that there are those who are in the church and that those who are outside of the church. And that God has designed the church to, uh, as we wait for Christ on this earth, to, to gather together as local assemblies where there are leaders, shepherds over the flock that are among them, and then collectively as, as we do that in our local assemblies, we are holding forth, we are the pillar and the buttress of the truth that Paul summarizes in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16 in a Christological statement. So we establish the basis of church membership. Believers are part of local churches. And then we looked also at the significance of church membership. Because the church is the body of Christ, because the leaders are appointed by the Holy Spirit according to Acts 20, 28, because the church belongs to God, because the church has been purchased by the blood of Christ, and because the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth, the church is significant. It's different from your Sam's Club membership. It is designed by God to be the place where eternal souls prepare for eternity. And so continuing on this morning, after establishing the biblical basis for church membership, the significance of church membership, we're going to consider today the responsibilities of church membership and the blessings of church membership. The responsibilities and the blessings of church membership. And as we look at these broad principles, last evening I, I was doing some work around a, one of our flower beds and just edging, making the, the, the distinction between where my grass was and where the flower bed was. And there's a lot of work that I still have to do in that flower bed to actually make it look nice. And I don't know, with the way things go at my house, it might never look nice. But that edging process was important. It's important. It's an important start to define things. And so that's what we're trying to do here is we're defining things and, and doing so in a way that we hope is an, an encouragement and a blessing to understand the body of Christ as we look at the revelation and the Word of God. So let's think first of all about the responsibilities of church membership, as we would come and be a part of a church, what does God say are the responsibilities? How do, we, how do we interact? How do we act as members of a church, as living stones, as what Peter describes us in that chapter? 
We'll turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at several passages this morning and the time that we have remaining. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The first responsibility that I want to point out from God's Word is faithful presence. Faithful presence. We're to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, and that necessitates then not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Now, this is verses 24 and 25, and so there is a context. Let's look at the context. Look at verse 19. The writer of Hebrews has established Christ as the final sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. There is no longer any offering for sin. And so he says, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, so let me just pause there. Notice what He does. He lays out two spiritual principles. We have confidence to come into the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We have confidence to go directly to God because of the work of Christ. In verse 21, that is because we have a great high priest, speaking of Christ over the house of God. All right, so those are the spiritual principles that he lays out. So based on that, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Do you see what's happening? The writer of Hebrews says, here is the spiritual reality. Here's what Christ has done for you. Now, here are the implications. Draw near. Would you argue, would you argue that because of what Christ has done that you should not draw near? No, let us draw near. And then looking down to verse 23, not only let us draw near, but let us hold fast. Would you argue that we ought not hold fast the confession? Of course not. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. And as a third implication of what Christ has done and of the spiritual blessings we have in Christ, let us stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting together as is the habit of some. Do you see the plain that the writer of Hebrews places the need to meet together? It's the same plane as holding fast the confession of Christ. It's the same plane as drawing near. Draw near, hold fast, stir up. It's all part of life in Christ. A faithful presence is required in Scripture of God's people that we come together so that we do stir one another up. We stimulate one another to serve Christ. Why? Because the day is coming near. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Are you living for Him? And we need that. 
Jesus warned us to not not become drunk with dissipation and, and to allow the things of this earth to crowd in and crowd out the spiritual realities of life. And that's what that's what the writer of Hebrews is picking up on here. We're, we're still in the flesh. We need, we need to gather together to stir one another up to love and good works. The next verse, verse 26, is rather sobering. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there's no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Here's the danger. The danger is The danger is that as we would move away from the body of Christ, that would simply be evidence that we don't belong to Christ. We would put ourselves in a position to spiritually fail because our flesh is strong. I don't know about you, but I need the body of Christ regularly. I need the stimulation of you all to love and good works. I need to be encouraged. I need to be challenged. I need to be preached at strongly so that my soul is convicted by my sinfulness and I'm turning and turning and turning to Christ. The reality is that for a season, it it can be easy. Look down at verses 32 and 33. Apparently, the people that are receiving this letter started out really well. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. What's happening? Well, well, at at the time of of receiving Christ, there was was some persecution that these people endured and, and they were joyful realizing, you know what? The world can take everything I have, but I have Christ and I have the body of Christ and we come together and we help one another. But things had gotten kind of easy apparently. And so in verse 36, the writer says, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Our gathering together consistently to stir up one another to love and good works is the expression of our faith. It's the expression of our faith that Christ is coming again. It's the expression of our faith that we need the body of Christ to prepare for that, that we are weak and that will be undone if we're on our own. And so we endure. Even when it seems like things are going great, I still need the body of Christ. So don't neglect to meet together. The first responsibility is faithful presence. Let's look at another responsibility. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this was in verse 25 of Hebrews 10 also. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 to 18 describe the coming of Christ. The day when the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are left and remain will be caught up with them in the air to be with the Lord. What a great day that will be at the trumpet of God. But as Paul concludes 
that glorious description of the coming of the Lord, he says in verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And then look at chapter 5, verse 11. Again, he's filling out the day of the Lord and how we ought order our lives because Christ is coming. And in verse 11, again, he concludes that section with the same exhortation. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Verse 14, he continues, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint heart, hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And again, we're looking in general principles. There's much in all of these passages, but a second responsibility that we see from this and other passages, we, we have faithful presence. We gather together regularly as an expression of our confession of faith in Christ, and we participate, secondly, in mutual encouragement. Right? When I come to church, when I gather with God's people throughout the week, when I interact with families, when we, when we talk with one another, there, there is a, a biblical uh, exhortation that we encourage one another, we build one another up. Those interactions are for mutual edification and mutual encouragement. It's often easy to come to church with the mindset, what can I get out of this, right? Did I get what I wanted? That's our fleshly def default. But what we find in Scripture is that as we look to Christ and as we anticipate gathering together, our heart is, how can I be a blessing? How can I encourage? How can I build up? I, I come, in other words, and meet with God's people with a prepared heart and mind to contribute to the mutual encouragement and mutual edification of the body of Christ because it is a body. And we function together as a body. So these are, you know, these are kind of building on one another, aren't they? I mean, it's, it's hard to have really close and significant mutual encouragement if we're not together. So it starts by coming together. We come together, and we come together to be an encouragement to one another in the things of the Lord. And notice again, and we've, you know, we've seen this in both passages we've turned to so far, these exhortations are all rooted in the reality that Christ is coming again. He lives, he's re reigning, and he's going to return. This is important, and we don't know when it will be. It might be before the end of this service. We'll be in the presence of Christ. What a glorious thing that would be. We mutually encourage one another. And, you know, here at Truth Community Church, this is, this is something that, that so many of you are really, really good at. You know, walk into the building and there's smiling faces of people who love the Lord and are here to encourage others. And what a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to walk in, to see those people week after week, knowing that their heart is to obey Christ and experiencing the encouragement in the Lord. Well, there's another responsibility in church membership. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 7 as the writer concludes the book here in, in Hebrews. He's giving practical instructions, more practical instructions because of the glorious body that we're a part of as we await Christ's return. In chapter 13, verse 7, the writer says, Remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. 
And then in verse 17, Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The third responsibility of church membership is humble submission. Humble submission. This is very un-American. The church is not a democracy. God has appointed leaders for the protection of the souls. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Look at verse 17 again. You know, if, if, if you just stop at obey your leaders and submit to them, that is really harsh, sounds like. But there's a reason. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. The instruction that leaders give to the people, to the flock of God, is instruction that is out of the authoritative Word of God for the good of your soul. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, right after the end of the, where we ended this morning at the beginning, in verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There's a reality that as we are waiting for Christ to come, as we're seeking to show forth the excellencies of His name, we, we are still dealing with the passions of our flesh that rise up, and they wage war. They wage war against our soul. And the responsibility of those called to shepherd the flock to give instruction, to give authoritative biblical instruction. It is done for the care of your soul. It, it is done with, with a charge, like a military charge. This is the way that God has laid out. Walk in this way because your passions are waging war against your soul and giving in to your passions is spiritually disastrous. It's often just it's sad sometimes when there are, there's so much brokenness in our world, isn't there? And, and there are people that have been through horrible, horrible things. And every now and then someone will come and say, you know, I, I need some help in a particular area. But then the next statement is, and don't tell me essentially what God has said. In other words, there's an understanding of what God has said, but I don't want to hear that. I, I want to, I'm basically trying to find a loophole to make life work. Well, you're not going to hear that. I'm sorry. The only thing I have is what God has said. The only thing that that leaders, qualified leaders have is what God has said because that's the only thing that's going to care for your soul. And more than that, to, to give any philosophies, to give any man-made solutions, there's a day that, that, that the leaders stand before Christ and what are we gonna say then? <laughs> Oh, Lord, you know, you didn't understand life in 2023. I mean, the Bible is antiquated. I, I couldn't give that advice. Oh, what a horrible, horrible account to give. You know, obey your leaders as those charged with keeping watch over your soul and those who will have to give an account and let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Here's the beauty of being in a, in a position to submit to leadership 
that God places over you in the church and in other realms as well, when you're in that role, your responsibility is to submit. The ones over you carry the responsibility of the instruction they're giving. And often the test of submission is not when things are going well and when I agree with everything, but when things are difficult and I disagree. And I say that, you know what? I might not agree with that, but there are people in my life that have been charged by God to watch over my soul. And so I'm going to obey. And I'm praying that when they have to give an account, that my obedience will contribute to them giving an account with joy. And God has promised that that kind of response is spiritually advantageous even for me. It all works together. Paul expresses the heart of leaders in 1 Thessalonians 2 when he says, we, we were like a mother and we were like a father among you. Look at that chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when he's speaking to this church. First Thessalonians 2, verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. And right before that, in verse 7, he says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And then down in verse 11, for you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Oh, dear people, when, when those who are charged with spiritual leadership come and say, brother or sister, can we talk about something? The Spirit... The Spirit is what Paul expresses here, a charge or a desire for you to walk in a manner worthy of God. That's all. That's all we want. To walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. And because we all have those passions that war against our soul, we need that. And God in His graciousness has provided it for us. Well, one other final aspect of the responsibilities of church membership. Turn back over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We've seen faithful presence, mutual encouragement, humble submission. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11, Peter writes, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The final aspect is a servant-hearted participation. A servant-hearted participation. Faithful presence, mutual encouragement, humble submission, and servant-hearted participation. God gifts every member of the body of Christ. We all have gifts given to us from our risen Savior Spiritual gifts that contribute to the building up of the body, to that mutual encouragement as we gather together. And, and, and here, Peter says, these gifts, these are 
These are gifts of God's varied grace, God's multifaceted grace. So when we come together from, from all of our different backgrounds with our, with our different testimonies, we come together as recipients, as, as recipients of, of God's multifaceted grace and God fits that together like living stones connected to Christ the cornerstone and the body is built up and the body functions like a body. It's remarkable, it's miraculous. Some, Peter says, are gifted to speak, so speak what God says the way God says it. Speak the oracles of God. Some are gifted more in the capacity of serving, so don't serve in your own strength, but serve by the strength that God supplies. And ultimately, ultimately, as the body functions together, God is glorified through Jesus Christ. It's a testimony. The functioning, vibrant body is a testimony to the resurrected Christ that he is continuing to build his church. And we do that, verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. We do that because God first loved us and we love one another. We contribute to the body because we love one another. We love one another as co-heirs with Christ Jesus. We love one another as those who will be together for all eternity singing the praises of God out of love for God and love for one another. We engage in servant-hearted participation. Well, that brings us to the last main point this morning, the blessings of church membership. The blessings of church membership. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. We'll go through, those, through these fairly rapidly this morning. Galatians chapter 3, or I'm sorry, chapter 6. There's overlap, I acknowledge, in these points. That's all right. I need repetition. Maybe I'm the only one. The blessings of church membership. Look at, look at Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you to be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are two in this passage. There's spiritual accountability. Spiritual accountability. That is a blessing of church membership. That knowing as part of the body, if I'm overtaken, if I'm entangled, that there are brothers around me, people who are filled with the Spirit, who will be willing to come and restore in a spirit of gentleness. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, who are the spiritual ones? Go back to chapter 5, those walking in the Spirit. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. And so as we gather together, we have, we have this element of spiritual accountability. And then in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Another blessing is that we share burdens that exceed our own capacity. We share the burdens of our own fleshliness as we, as we seek to restore one another. We, we share burdens of, of the heaviness of life and the brokenness of sins. We come along one, one another and we bear those burdens that are too heavy to bear. And in doing so, we fulfill the law of Christ as we love one another. I'm just going to mention these and the references Another blessing is that we grow in maturity in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 through 13, the teachers are given to us so that we might, we might mature in Christ. 
And in verse 14, that maturity leads to a protection from false teaching so that we're not tossed to and fro by the waves and every deceitful doctrine that comes along. There's a spiritual accountability. There's sharing burdens that exceed our own capacity and a growing maturity in Christ, protection from false teaching. And finally, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. On Friday, we had the privilege together of observing the Lord's table. And we do that to remember the death of Christ. We do it with self-examination. We do it as a declaration. And we do it until He comes. Look at verse 26. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We gather, we examine ourselves, we proclaim that our assurance of salvation rests in Christ's finished work alone. And we proclaim it, and we proclaim it until the day we're in His presence, until He comes. Church membership is part of the preparation for Christ's return. God, God ordains spiritual protection and preparation for Christ's return to happen through the local church. Christ established the local church to prepare you and those around you for the one inevitable event of your existence. What is the one inevitable event of your existence? Standing before Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now you, you plural, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. May the Lord give us grace to serve our risen Savior, yes, individually through His redeeming grace, but collectively as a local body of Christ holding forth, holding forth the truth that Christ is coming again. Father, we thank You today that You sent Christ that He lived a perfect life, that He died a death for us in our place as He took upon Himself the wrath, Your wrath, that we deserve. Oh Lord, we thank You for the church. We thank You for the promises that have been fulfilled, that are continuing to be fulfilled as Christ, our living Savior, builds His church. And we thank You for this local church. We thank You for the work that You are doing in building, building people connected to Christ the cornerstone as a living building that we might show forth the excellencies of the One who has called us by His mercy. Lord, we love you. We pray that as we go from here today, we would go renewed in our spiritual strength to serve you with multiplied grace as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.